So the topic, first of all, let me say something about the topic, which is that uh, there's two things going on that we're interested in. And one is uh, first, just the categories that, uh, that people have uh, when they talk about it. Why do Marxists talk about democratic revolution and socialist revolution? It's, you know, it's not quite twin brother. So that's one question. And, and, and how did that category and that framework, how did it start and how, what changed it? And is it in the back of our mind should be the question, is it much of use today? Uh, and my thought on the matter is, without being uh, very dogmatic about it, is that while on the one hand, the talking about the democratic revolution shows something very deep about Marxist logic, on the other hand, this uh, category may have uh, run out its usefulness quite a while ago. Uh, then the other thing is actual, what was actually going on uh, and uh, in Europe, in Russia in 1917. So uh, we'll have to sort of toggle between those two uh, layers. Okay, uh, I think I'm gonna put on my glasses because I got this written in notes. Okay, so uh, so in the 1840s, let's go back there. Marx is just, you know, he's on the verge of writing the manifesto and he, uh, he one thing that's unique about his approach and the approach of his, his group is that they insisted on the necessity of a de democratic revolution. So that was something uh, that was something that the Marxists stood out for among socialists. Uh, they, the socialists said, let's, okay, we want socialism, let's have a socialist revolution. And he said, no, you got to have a democratic revolution first. So the first thing it behooves us to know is what we, was going on in his mind, what was the logic here. And uh, I'll tell you the, the way that's not a good way of thinking about it, although it's the way that's often ascribed to Marx. And that's the, that's the view that it's sometimes called stageism. And so this what this says, I mean, I, before I go into this, I should say Marx did not think this way. This is not what he thought. Uh, that there's sort of a historical laws uh, about the evolution in the uh, societies, one, two, three, four. And at one stage, the bourgeois come in and they have a democratic revolution. And there's sort of a historical law that has to take place. And uh, that uh, then there's a long period, a long period between the democratic and socialist sort of non-revolutionary period. and uh, a lot of writers insist that, that Marx and other Marxists uh, had, had this long period, which uh, there's no contextual evidence of for this. So uh, then the bourgeois flourished for a while, and then there's another new revolution with the workers. So that's the, um, what I call the stagism, except I, I might, and so there's, I call myself an anti-anti-stagist because uh, I'm, of course, not defending stagism, but, but my point is that no one else did either. I mean, it's not a, a position that you can really find. And so I'm against the people who, who spend a lot of their time attacking stagism. And uh, this, well, okay, so so what then? <laughs> what is the way to think about it? And why did Marx insist on the democratic revolution? Because in the situation he faced, the democratic revolution was going to give workers necessary tools to do what he thought they needed to do. And in particular, central to all this is political freedoms. Uh, and by political freedoms, I mean the sort of a range of this absolutely essential things. Uh, there's, uh, you know, uh, freedom of speech to start off with, freedom of assembly, freedom to uh, have, have unions, freedom of uh, assembly. So uh, freedom to organize, just freedom to, to uh, create the sort of workers' movement that Lenin, sorry, that uh, Marx wanted. And uh, essentially, uh, political freedom meant the ability to, for the workers to discuss among themselves, to talk about what their interests were and what they weren't, and who was their allies and who was their enemies, and uh, to organize and to become an effective political force. And if you read uh, Marx and his buddies around 19, 1847, 48, that's what you'll find. I put this all in an article. It was in historical materialism about a year ago on Marx. Uh, so why is political freedom so crucial to the whole Marxist uh, way of looking at things? So two reasons. One is very, pretty deep and one is more the situation in Europe at the time. Uh, it's, uh, it's, first of all, the deep reason is that the, the whole idea of Marxism is, Marxism, the Marxist approach to these matters is not a, essentially a different view of socialism 
it's essential it's essentially a different view of how to get to socialism and in particular it's the idea that it's the workers who are going to do it it's they have a historical mission and they the, the the emancipation of the workers is the job of the workers themselves and they've got to organize and they've got to understand and know what they're doing uh and you can't do that without discussing without organizing without hearing the message without you know i mean if Marx can, he needs to be able to print his works and send them around, he needs to have agitators and propagandists and uh, party people to go around and talk about him and all these things that you need to have workers movement. Cause so that's so that's the deep reason uh, is that uh, the role of the workers in in their historical mission. The the very important but more uh, situational reason is that most countries in Europe, Germany especially, were under the uh, were ab were under absolutist regimes. Uh, of various kinds, uh, which it, it put down political freedom and and just modern life in general. So, so he really wanted to get rid of those guys. And I think one of the things that people kind of misunderstanding of Marx when you read him is not to understand how much that was on his mind, getting rid of absolutism, getting rid of the princes. Uh, okay, why bourgeois dem democratic? Why, why did he insist? Uh, why was the thought was that it was bourgeois? Well, back then, uh, uh, you know, I, I, why not say to Marx, well, listen, if you're, if it's so important to have political freedom, why not have the uh, workers do it? If they want it, they need it, so let put it on their agenda. But uh, they, Marx and Engels looked around them and what they saw, first of all, was first a fairly, what they thought was a fairly revolutionary bourgeois movement that was, had reason and ability to overthrow absolutism. Uh, the bourgeois interests were also hampered by by these things. And so the bourgeois was willing and able, and then the proletariat, uh, the workers were not ready. They were under-organized, they were under, they didn't uh, didn't understand their own interests properly, et cetera, et cetera. They were fairly weak, and, and you can find some fairly strong statements by Marx and Engels to this effect. So the idea was that the bourgeois would make the revolution, the proletariat would support them, but they weren't ready for a leading role yet. Uh, but they would take advantage of what the bourgeois had brought them and they would get it. So that's why you need a democratic revolution. And so the, the Marxists, this logic that they worked out was kind of a hard sell because they had to go to the workers and say, you see that bourgeois over there, your enemy, your oppressor, your exploiter? Well, support him in the next political revolution. And uh, it took a while for this logic to get, to get over. Okay, so uh, a conclusion from this before we go on is that as a, uh, a way of looking at these things is not stagism, forget stagism, but what I, I've coined a term that you could, uh, tasks, tasksism. The, the, the way they, they looked about revolution is revolutions have certain tasks. In the case of this, the democratic revolution, the task is to get, essentially to get political freedom, but to get the, a lot of other things uh, that will help the workers movement. There's various tasks that you need to get done. And the idea is to speed up. It's not to slow down and wait a whole period, not to have a purgatory period. The idea is to speed up the whole process by giving the workers necessary tools. Uh, and along with the task is an agent, class agent. Uh, so it's the bourgeois democratic revolution. So, so in the, in the Marxist framework, it's bourgeois democratic versus the, the, the original way of setting it up, bourgeois democratic versus proletarian socialist. And that's the sort of deep structure of Marxism is that the agent and the task go together, right? So, um, and later on, uh, writers such as Kautsky and Lenin, these people, they use the phrase active forces and prospects. So I think that's the same thing, uh, tasks and agents. The tasks are the prospects of what revolution can be expected to do. Uh, and the and the agent is the active forces. What are the what are the class forces, the social forces, that in particular time, to, particular situation? What can we expect from them in terms of revolution? Okay. So my next uh, chapter in this is uh, I call it toward hegemony, and I th uh, it's uh, my basis for this is is it's a lot of uh, Engels Engels writing on worker movements in various countries, a sort of body of his writings. That have been overlooked really a lot, um, and but are really crucial. So, so between 1848 and 1850, when they came up with this, uh, well, when they first put it forth, and like 1890, turn of the century, uh, things were changing. Things were changing for that had an impact on this whole model. And the two that are important to us is that the bourgeois down and the proletarian up. 
That is to say, uh, the bourgeois as a revolutionary force got timid, got afraid of the workers, uh, realized that they could make a cozy deal with the people like Bismarck. That so there, there was sort of more and more like a spent force as a, as as a, as, a, as someone who's going to overthrow the, uh, the 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 bad guys, the um, Bismarck and the Tsar and so forth. They just they weren't <laughs> they weren't up to it. However, at the same time, uh, Marx and Engels were pleased to see the, 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 that the proletariat was organizing, that the Marxist message was getting out there, that the powerful party in Germany, especially, there's other large parties with a, with a Marxist contingent. So things look good as far as that goes. So they now were, so they sort of the, the task of, of leading the democratic revolution more and more shifted over from the, from the bourgeoisie to the proletariat. In, in, the, in the thinking of the, of the Marxist people like uh, uh, Kautsky and Lenin and, uh, but all Engels, the whole, you know, and, and, the, and, the, and the German party. Uh, okay, uh, and as one, uh, one more thing about this is that then the proletariat more and more was given, is gonna have the democratic evolution. It means that they're also gonna be the leader of the people or the Volk or the Narod or whatever you wanna call them, Le Peuple. Uh, the the sort of non-socialist but but democratic revolution conceivably revolutionary forces. Okay, so now now we're ready to at least get up to Russia and to Lenin uh, uh, and the with 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 hegemony. And hegemony is a word that uh, is a little hard to use because, uh, as you all know, it has a lot of different meanings. So. Uh, I tend I like to say Bolshevik hegemony, but I don't know if that's going to really <laughs> help us much. Uh, and okay, there's, so there are, uh, I mean, I'm not dive in here, the discussion right after the 1905 revolution, when the, when the Marxists, both in Germany and Russia were trying to get a hold of this experience and, uh, and, and make sense of it and, and to use it for the next thing. So, uh, and the, there's a classic article by Kautsky, it's called Prospects and Driving Forces of the Russian Revolution, it came out in late 1906. And uh, in, and when it came out, all the really left-wing uh, social democrats just loved it. Uh, Lenin and Trotsky both, and Stalin for that matter, uh, all said, "Oh, this is the greatest thing since I spread." So, so this is something that unites uh, this, this 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 logic that's set forth in this article. And I think it's like the one article that everybody who's interested in. Uh, left-wing left -wing social democracy, Bolshevism, everything. This is one article everyone should read. So if you, I, I put up the, the whole article is interesting. It's not, a, I don't know if it's anywhere available easily online, but the crucial part is the last bit. And I have translated that and put it up online. If you just, uh, yeah, I, I tried it this morning. If you just Google Lee Kautsky hegemony, you'll, you'll get it. It's uh, the proletariat and its ally. Okay, so there are two concepts here going. One is hegemony slash leadership. Those two terms are used almost interchangeably. And at, one, at some point around 12, 1912, 13, Lenin stops using hegemony, I think, because he didn't think the word was, was, the word was getting a bad rep. If Germany is looking for world hegemony, then, then the Bolsheviks don't wanna be seen looking for hegemony. Uh, anyway, so hegemony and or leadership in Russian, rukovodstvo and uh, and then there's another phrase, uh, which is democratic revolution to the end or to its completion. And then Russian is da konsa. And I should have to say right now that there's a translation problem here only in the fact that the standard, uh, the standard uh, Lenin translations, I don't know why, but for some reason they didn't like hegemony and didn't like da konsa to the end or some. So they translate it, not only do they don't translate it as the way you might think, but they use different ways of doing it. So you can't just code it. So unfortunately for, for, for people who read English, the, these two technical terms, I mean, the basic argument is there, but, but these technical terms are missing and it, it, hurts, it hurts understanding what's going on. Okay, uh, so the key idea that uh, Kautsky and Lenin and Bolshevism and Trotsky had in mind is that, and actually many of the Mensheviks to, to, to be, fair, uh, is, is that the proletariat, the Russian, they're now talking about Russia, the socialist proletariat is, uh, is 
is the natural leader of the democratic revolution precisely because it's socialist, precisely because uh, the, the proletariat is socialist and has it, for it, democracy is only a means, socialism is the goal, it's the end, uh, is, it's the only force that will go take the democratic revolution all the way to the end. Uh, it's the only one, and to the end here means get everything, milk it for all it's worth, to get everything out of the democratic revolution you can in terms of tools that can be used for worker organization and for uh, for modernizing the country and all the other things that will help bring about socialism. Uh, uh, and uh, so the idea is that uh, uh, everybody else either does not understand why, uh, like the peasants don't, they're, they're democratic, but they don't understand, or the bourgeoisie don't want to go, don't want to, they actively don't want to go to the, take democratic revolution to the end because they're afraid of the, of the same things that the, that the proletariat wants. Uh, it's a, 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 an organized, conscious, militant uh, working class aiming at socialism. So uh, the way I can be put is, uh, that for for democracy and political freedom was for the for the for the social democratic party in Russia, it was it was a means, not an end, but it was an absolutely necessary means. So, so they were they were greater uh, champions of democratic rights and, and political freedom than the liberals or the democrats. Uh, Russia wasn't too many democrats of that kind in Russia at all. But anyway, they were. Uh, so so the the, the proletarian had a duty now, not only to lead socialism when the time came, but to lead the democratic revolution. And to do this, it needed an ally, and the ally, of course, was the peasantry. So from this point on, the concept of democratic revolution in Russia, but in just generally in this in the discourse, is wrapped up with the peasantry, because the peasantry is the problem. Pe uh, not, well, it's also an opportunity, but it's the problem for this way of thinking because it's it's revolutionary, it's anti czarist uh, or at least potentially, uh, but it's not uh, by usual uh, Marxist social democratic way of looking at things, not socialist, you know, petty bourgeois. So, uh, uh, but they are fully democratic in their objective interests and, and peasants are in this view of things rational ultimately. So. They were. They are going to be willing to accept proletarian leadership. So it's a, that's the wager, the the, the analysis of uh, Bolshevik hegemony or or leadership. And for me, this is the heart of the heart of Bolshevism. <coughs> so, uh, so uh, the peasants play a role in the distinction between democratic and socialist revolution, uh, as Kautsky put it, and was. Uh, and was uh, confirmed and affirmed by the Russian people like Lenin, uh, that it was both the guarantee and the main force that will help you a democratic revolution, but it also is the main force and the main reason why you're, why you're going to have, uh, uh, not have socialist revolution. So all the Russians uh, signed on to this logic that the peasants in Russia would stop uh, in the in the immediate future, stop socialist transformation in Russia. It was it was a blockade. It was a barrier. You couldn't get past it. Okay. So what does this uh, new logic uh, do for the framework of bourgeois democratic revolution, proletarian social revolution? Well, it puts a lot of pressure on it. It starts, you know, the the framework starts getting a little bent and a little crazy. And uh, so uh, I'll I'll, uh, I'll read what Kautsky said about this and. Uh, it's both interesting in and of itself, but it's also historically important because I've seen this quoted many times by Bolsheviks, including, including footnote uh, by one speaker who was supporting Lenin's April thesis in April 1917 and quoted this Kautsky business. Okay, this is Kautsky in 1906 in this article that I, I, that I told you about. The age of bourgeois revolutions, that is of revolutions in which the bourgeoisie was the driving force is over is over in Russia too. There too, the proletariat is no longer an appendage and tool of the bourgeoisie, which the original Marxist analysis in 19, 1840 tended to be, as it was in bourgeois revolutions, but an in the old bourgeois revolutions, but an independent class with independent revolutionary aims. But whenever the proletariat comes forth in this way, the bourgeoisie ceases to be a revolutionary class. Therefore, 
The bourgeoisie does not belong to the driving forces of the present revolutionary movement in Russia. And to this extent, we cannot call the Russian revolution a bourgeois one. So already in 1906, uh, we're, we're talking about the fact that the Russia is not completely a bourgeois revolution. But then he goes on to say it, uh, it's, not, it's, not a, it's not a socialist revolution either because of the, uh, the peasants mainly. So we should probably do best do justice to the Russian Revolution and the tasks, note, <laughs> that it sets us if we view it neither as a bourgeois revolution in the traditional sense, nor as a socialist one, but as a completely unique process that is happening on the borderline between bourgeois and socialist society. One that requires the dissolution of the one uh, while preparing the formation of the other, and in any case is bringing all of humanity, the ganze Menschheit, living within capitalist civilization, a powerful stage further in its development. So this is a real hymn of praise to the historical significance of the Russian Revolution already in 1906. Uh, okay, so so like here's uh, Lenin said, you know, Kautsky has just given a good argument for fundamental Bolshevik tactics. So here's, the, here's how he said that. Here's how he summed up, the, he called this the fundamental principle of Bolshevik tactics. Quote, a bourgeois revolution brought about by the proletariat and the peasantry despite the instability of the bourgeoisie. Okay, so bourgeois revolution, even though the bourgeois has inst inst unstable and the proletariat and the peasantry are the driving forces. So at some point you want to begin to wonder why are we calling this a bourgeois revolution? Uh, okay, um, uh, let's get on to the logic of the, um, okay, uh, so let me, let me make, make one, I'm going to jump, uh, just glance ahead a little bit of foreboding here to, to, um, to 1917, and to say that what this logic is, is that the bourgeois revolution does not require bourgeois leadership. That's like the fundamental uh, arguing point of Bolshevism. So in 1917, uh, to say that 19, if anyone in 1917 says it's a bourgeois revolution, either the Menshevik or Bolshevik or whoever, uh, it doesn't it, it doesn't tell you whether or not that person wants the, the bourgeoisie to be running the government, say, because uh, bourgeois revolutions, you know, uh, the, the, it's like you know the, uh, Lenin and the others are saying the bourgeoisie can't be don't, they don't know their own revolution and they can't be carried can't be counted on to carry out their own revolution. Okay, with the logic of the min, min, minimum and maximum program as start is using around then, and I thought I'd just say a couple words about that. I'm sure you're familiar with it, but I just want to run over the logic. Uh, and and the, uh, in my opinion, the names don't really reflect the basic logic here because minimum, the minimum program really is, the logic behind it is the maximum that can be attained uh, under capitalism, under bourgeois domination. Uh, but that's a lot. And in Russia, it's a hell of a lot. Uh, and so the one thing I think is a mistake is to say, oh, it's unambitious. It's unambitious, the minimum program. That's what it sounds like. Oh, it's, we're, we're, we're playing for small small stakes here. Uh, no, no, no. It, it, was, it was extremely ambitious, the 1905 revolution, to say we, the proletariat, are going to lead a revolution that's going to carry out the minimum program. Which, it would transform Russia, land of the peasants, democratic. Uh, democratic republic and everything, uh, modernization on all accounts. So it was, and they didn't, they didn't, they didn't get there. They didn't get anywhere near that. So, um, so it was very, very ambitious. And so sometimes when I read in uh, in historical works, so Lenin was still rather timid in 1905. I, yes, no, that's that's not the way to look at it. The maximum program, you can also think about that as it's the minimum <laughs> that's that's that is practically possible in order to justify proletarian uh, taking power. Uh, that is to say, so uh, the maximum program is, is socialism, right? But it's also, unless you can do the maximum program, you should not be in power. That's so, uh, so it's, so it's the minimum that, that, that you should be able to do. If you take power before that minimum is, is, is possible, uh, you, uh, you will get corrupted by, you will be turned into a, you know, a caretaker for, for, for capitalism. Uh, okay, listen, I'm going to, I had a business here where I went into the debates between the various people about um, participation in a revolutionary government and Trotsky and the Menshevik and so forth. 
I'm going to skip over that because uh, it's a little not germane and I can see already that, but of course, if you <laughs> if people want to ask about it, I'll tell you what the idea. Okay, let's shoot ahead to um, 1917. And uh, um, okay, uh, and I analyzing what was going on in 1917 in terms of this in terms of this uh, framework that we've that we've, we've tried to examine both the fundamental logic behind it and and its history and and the way it's uh, the way the concepts are already changing very very severely. Um, okay, so a very famous comment uh, anyone who's read about the 1917 revolution will know this is that is Kamenev. Okay, I go from one K to another K here from Kamenev to Kautsky Kamenev. So Kamenev. Uh, said in uh, when he was uh, expressing his misgivings about the April thesis in April 1917 against you know against Lenin not not against the April thesis but why he thought there was problems with it and he said the problem with it is that he, you're talking about the socialist revolution and the bourgeois democratic revolution is not finished yet so so you can't be talking about the socialist revolution yet okay so this is like famous because it, it says aha the, Demo the, the Bolsheviks are either like turned into Mensheviks all of a sudden, uh, or uh, or there's some logic behind it that that means that uh, they want to counter us anyway, uh, and maybe Stalin um, is are they they suddenly they want the provisional we support the provisional government we want that same power I and mean, we're 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 saying these old things well. Okay, this is one reason why I went into all this stuff, logic stuff, because now we know that if there's the basic axiom of Bolshevism is precisely bourgeois revolution doesn't mean bourgeois leadership. It's just So if uh, if Kamenev is saying bourgeois democratic revolution not finished, he's not implying uh, that the bourgeois should take over, quite the opposite. He's implying that the revolution isn't over yet and therefore we should get him out of there and, and carry out our revolution. Uh, so, uh, that's what he meant, um, and I can prove this by not, you know, I'm not making it up. I can show it. In fact, I'm writing something right now about this. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, Lenin and Trotsky both agreed with this, that what, maybe not with the way Kamenev have put it, but with the basic fact that, okay, here's the most important thing you have to, to, to realize about this. You don't need Russia to be a socialist revolution in order to justify uh, Soviet power. Okay, so that's the key thing. The, the key thing in Russia in 1917 is power to the all power of the Soviets. And you don't need the logic of socialist revolution. In fact, it gets in the way. That's what they all decided. So Lenin and Trotsky both went out of their way to, to make this clear. And uh, I've put both of these, uh, <clears throat> Both of uh, in the same online series as the the one I just gave you, uh, the the I have put in the uh, the one on Lenin, one on Trotsky, uh, demonstrating that they made these points. And uh, Lenin, you know, uh, well, I'll get to that in a second. So, um, uh, but I like Trotsky's uh, comment on this in August 1970 from an article that he wrote then, where he said to say that. Of the bourgeois have to lead a bourgeois revolution, that's just plain stupid. <laughs> and I tend to agree with them. So uh, both of them said, uh, uh, both of them went out of the way to argue, listen, I, uh, there's lots of social socialist elements going on in our revolution. But even if it's a purely bourgeois democratic revolution, <laughs> we still need Soviet power because you can't trust these, these capitalists and these landowners and these generals to even do the basic bourgeois tasks they can't they can't get much less uh respond to the russia's crisis okay so that's the basic thing which is that uh uh for various reasons the uh, the trotsky people the stalin people the american academics ever seem to have got themselves uh, into believing that you needed to say it's a socialist revolution in order to justify soviet power so that's not the case and the irony is that Lenin and Trotsky went out of their way to make this clear in 1917. Now, uh, I think a little footnote here would be the, is, is good to say the following. Kamenev, why did, well, why did Kamenev say this? Why did Kamenev say, uh, if, if what I'm saying is true, that Lenin 
didn't want so well wasn't thinking in terms of course he didn't he wasn't saying it has to be a socialist revolution in russia to justify soviet power so why was Kamenev making this remark well uh because uh he misunderstood the April Theses. And why did he understood the April Theses? Because the Mensheviks got there first. The Mensheviks and Plekhonov, this guy who's even to the right of the Mensheviks, a socialist uh, though, uh, immediately jumped on the theses to say, aha, you want social revolution in Russia. That's crazy. So therefore, Soviet power is crazy. They're the ones, the Mensheviks and Plekhonov, who want to try as close a tie as possible between socialist revolution in Russia. Not not worldwide, not European wide, and and Soviet power because that for them that would make the the, the project um, uh, unfeasible. And you know, here's a little irony that even before Lenin and Trotsky showed up, people accused Kamenev of being a permanent revolution guy because they wanted to see the Bolsheviks uh, arguing this sort of thing. So Lenin came back; he had the April Theses. And he realized that people were misunderstanding it. So he went out of his way to clear it up. And that's why this article, which I call a basic question, you know, they were they were having a Bolshevik party conference and there was a day break in, and Lenin said, okay, I got to get this cleared up. And he wrote the article. He didn't say, I want to make it clear to my fellow Bolsheviks, but he did, that's, that, that's what he was trying to do, trying to convince. Listen, I'm not saying this these things like, uh, I think the, uh, a peasant, petty bourgeois uh, country, is ready for social revolution. I'm not. I'm not saying that. So, um, so that's that's what happened there. But why is it the people are so convinced that he did say it? And uh, uh, okay, the main reason they're convinced is they haven't looked. They haven't looked at the material. Uh, and uh, the Russian, the Soviet historians, especially, they have, they're committed, they're, they're, the government and the party authorities told them, you have to say this. Um, so they have to say it. I don't know what our excuse over here in the West is, but the Soviet, uh, Soviet historians had to say it. And so, but can they point to anything? And uh, yes, they point to what Lenin said about first and second stages of the revolution. He did say something about that in the, in the April DC. He didn't say anything about social, the bourgeois democratic revolution. Um, uh, he, uh, so, uh, but so it, I, again, I don't want to get into the technicalities. So just as I said, the first and second stage, he used it, he used it the first time in like 1915. Um, uh, it, it, he used it in the letter, for, letter from afar, which various times he uses it. He, and he's not talking about bourgeois socialist revolution. He's, he's talking, the first stage is overthrowing the czar and the second stage later on in the revolution is when the workers take power with the support of the peasantry. So uh, it, 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 this is a textual matter, but I'm telling you <laughs> that first and second stage does not mean uh, Bolsh uh, Bolshevik and sorry, <laughs> bourgeois democratic versus socialist. And um, in an article I did, and uh, if you want to look this up, an article I did for the uh, for the Weekly Worker uh, has some data on this. Okay, uh, and so uh, that's one fact you should know that Lenin went out of his way to refute this uh, more than once. Also, another fact, uh, which is uh, uh, is that there was a de facto embargo on even using these terms after the end of April. Now, this is something I don't have any document to say, the Central Committee made a decision of this and that, but I'm sure it happened, something like this happened because it vanishes, it's not in anybody's writing. Uh, and another person who's looked at a lot of material from 1917, Eric Blanc, confirms me on this negative result. So, um, so, uh, and I think the reason is they said it's distracting. It gets us. It, it, it puts us on the defensive. Uh, uh, we're not going to go around saying uh, you're not going to go to a, a, a factory of workers and say we're carrying out the bourgeois democratic revolution. It's just that's not a good rallying call. It's too hard to explain. It's Marxist. Uh, it's learned Marxist stuff that doesn't isn't going to sell. So, um, uh, so. <clears throat> 
I, I, they just said, stop talking about the revolution. And that's, that's what made sense. That made, made sense in the messages. Now, you, if, you, if you go to the party, con party conferences or other places where Bolsheviks are talking to Bolsheviks, you can find occasions when they talk about social revolution. So I'm not saying they never used it and, or stopped thinking this way, but they, 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 I, I'm sure that some sort of directive went out, do not use this you know, like in Pravda or whatever. Uh, it's, it's just creates problems and doesn't lead to clarity in any way. And they did talk about proletarian dictatorship, but, but of course that did not mean that the proletarian was going to rule everybody with an, with an iron whip and rule only in their own interests. Of course, the idea of the proletarian dictatorship was number one, there would still be a democracy voting that was meant seriously, though the whole country, the whole, the whole Narod anyway was going to vote. And secondly, uh, the, 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 the proletariat was doing this because of its leadership role, not because it was going to rule in its own interests. Okay, uh, but then let me, I got to get now switch to the other side and say what ways did they think of 1917 as a socialist revolution? That's the other side of this. And there's lots of ways in which it was a social revolution by anybody's standards. Uh, number one, it was led by socialists, right? <laughs> it was led by socialists. Every, any single per, any single politician that it that had any standing whatsoever in the in the Narod in the Soviet constituency was a socialist. This is just that fact about Russia that it's hard to duplicate anywhere else. Actually, as far as I can tell. Uh, and then secondly, they all wanted to. Uh, that was their goal. The ultimate goal was socialism. They were doing, they would do whatever they could to, to, to use this revolution. And that was one of the reasons they thought, even if it didn't do anything directly socialist, even if it only didn't do any trans transformation, it would, it would still be socialist because that was their aim. That was their aspiration. That's what they were doing it for. Now, the third factor is that, uh, that they all believed, and again, this is something that's even wider than the, the, Menshe, the Bolsheviks, the Mensheviks, a lot of Mensheviks too, that Europe was on the eve of a socialist revolution. And they've been thinking this for, for a decade and the war speeded it up. So, uh, so they really, they, that's another reason. And they thought that, so then here's the fourth and maybe the most important reason is that uh, Russia was going to play a role, even if, even if it was a purely democratic revolution in Russia, it would play a role in this world socialist revolution. And this was a way of scenario or a way of thinking that went back to 1905, because 1905, while it failed a democratic revolution, still had very inspiring forces around the world, you know, Japan, Turkey, and, and uh, Austria, and so forth. So, so they had a scenario that, that if we take revolution duck on sa to the end, we're going to inspire, maybe even spark off, help spark off the, uh, the, the socialist revolution, which is in the wings. It's in. It's already ready to go out there, but this will really get it going. And uh, so the way Lenin put it was that they're separate, but the link between them is getting tighter and tighter. Uh, so, so, uh, so there's that. There's sort of the idea that, uh, and, and when, when there's an international revolution, I should add, that would change according to the way of thinking. Would change everything. Change the context for Russia. You know, you get. Democratic revolution in Russia, but can't go any further than the peasants. Then you have a socialist revolution in Europe. And then because they're socialist and advanced and rich and so forth, they'll help you move the peasants along. Uh, so uh, then, okay, how, I don't know how many points I've got lost track. Fifth point, maybe sixth. Uh, in, in 1917, uh, then uh, this is something that new, I think that Lenin had. Most of what I said before is, pre-1917 and, and fairly widespread. But he said, okay, if it's such a tight link and, and, and if we can really count on the social revolution taking place, why not start moving towards socialism right away here in, in Russia, especially because the emergency is, uh, is forcing us to take socialist type measures. And that's what he called steps towards socialism, which I think is the phrase, best phrase to use to sum up as you, he used it all the time. And the logic behind that is uh, the emergency, the logic of the emergency, the, the logic of the emergency <coughs> is making us uh, uh, adopt measures that are socialist. And so when the time comes, when, this, when the, when the, when the uh, international revolution takes place, we were, we're already marching down that road. 
uh, and uh, in a sense, essentially, he's saying, do what you want to do anyway. Do what what everyone says you should do. A big state regulation, uh, land for the peasants, uh, all this stuff, peace. Uh, all, do it, but do it because you know it's the old logic. The proletariat is best equipped to do it because it's not afraid of socialism. It will go ahead and do it. Okay, steps towards socialism. Okay, so so by the time Lenin has explained this logic, it's new, it's innovative, but it's not so scandalous or shocking to Bolshevik ears. Uh, and I can I can uh, have uh, articles and speeches by say Kamenev and Stalin endorsing the logic of this and like they understood it and you know they're not being just hangers on. Okay. <coughs> Uh, okay, I'm going to just say a few words about democracy and a couple of things about democracy, uh, democratic revolution in 1917, basically to make this point that the Soviet revolution was a legitimate, electorally legitimate revolution, that the only national institution in 1917 with any electoral legitimacy was the Congress of Soviets, the first and the second, uh, and that the Bolsheviks won fair and square uh, uh, a, a majority within the Soviet constituency. Uh, so it was not an overthrow of parliamentary democracy. It was not even a coup, really. It was, uh, it was because, because essentially the, the Soviet had, that had had the last word since February, since the big first hours of the February Revolution, the, the, uh, the, the, the Petrograd and then the National Soviet had the last word. If they didn't choo choose to use it, that was their decision. They still had that last word. And so it, finally they, just, they decided, the Soviet, freely, independently, without coup, without force, that they wanted to toss out the, all the bourgeois parties. Uh, and then uh, the Constituent Assembly, well, uh, again, um, I don't want to get into that, but at the same time, you know, if you if you had let the Constituent Assembly take over in January 1918, you would have had to put down Soviets all over Russia. You'd have to put down the Third Congress of Soviets, which met. Uh, so it's just, it, that battle should be between, again, as a battle between two forms of democratic le legitimacy. Both, both had their arguments for being democratically legitimate, uh, but another one. <coughs> and then I'll just mention in passing my own label for 1917, which is uh, not democratic bourgeois revolution, but democratic anti-bourgeois revolution. It's a very democratic revolution, both in what I've just been saying and, and in its feeling. It was, it was democratic because it, they, in, in the sense of, I don't like the elites, you know, almost the almost populist sense. That word is also a, not a very helpful word, but it means you know people who really don't like the elite, and uh, so so it's democratic, but it's anti-bourgeois in its core. Uh, uh, so I'll just let that go as a as a as a bon mot. Okay, so uh, after October, I, the title says I'm going to say something about after October, and I will. Uh, we have the, uh, the what I call the zebra problem, which is. Is the Russian Revolution and the, and the following civil war, is it a democratic revolution with socialist uh, stripes, as it were? Or is it a socialist revolution with democratic stripes? That is to say, uh, is it something that, you, you, should we think of it as a socialist revolution, which accomplishes democratic tasks along the way, which I think is probably the standard way that the people on the left think about it, or a democratic revolution that has was led by socialists and has socialist aspirations? I don't know exactly. Very many people think about that way, but I think it's a pretty good way of <laughs> pretty good way of doing it. And let me quote something that sort of influenced me. This is from a Menshevik leader named Fyodor Don, uh, who was in Russia in 1920, 21, and left uh, early 22. Well, left, you know, was more or less kicked out. And he has a good book. It's an available in English called uh, Two Years of Wandering." It, it's a good memoir of this period. You know, very partisan, but. Um, so he observed, he says, he looked at the Red Army and the Red Army was like the one thing that was like functioning, he thought, in, in Soviet Russia. Uh, and it was, it was, they were, he was very impressed with the way that the Red Army could fight and with, with, with heroism and uh, fighting off the, uh, the, the, the counter revolution and the reaction. So he said, the Russian Revolution, quote, is a peasant revolution, albeit one that's, which is strongly influenced in its course by proletarian ideology and politics and not a directly socialist revolution. 
The real victor in all the civil wars of the Bolshevik period has been the Russian peasant and him alone. Okay, well, I don't want to endorse that all the way, but I think <laughs> I think we should take it seriously. Uh, and uh, if we try to answer the zebra question, it depends on when we when we when we answer it. Because if we answer it like way decades in the, later, then socialism looms a lot larger because they had a socialist economy and this and that. But in in uh, let's, let's look at it in Lenin's lifetime. And uh, the reason I say that too is because Lenin. Everyone uh, about every year uh, would write up sort of a balance sheet, and so we could know what he thought about it of the revolution. What was the biggest change in in uh, the uh, between Russia of the beginning in 1917 and Russia at the end of say 1922? Biggest change was that there was no more landlord class. It had gone. It was the people were gone. Well, many of the pe individuals were there, but they they. they uh, uh, that whole set of property relations had gone. They were as liquidated as a class, to use the letter expression. That's like the slaveholders in the South. They just weren't there. And the peasants had the land and the, and the, visit, and the villages controlled it. So that's the biggest change. Then there's tons of other democratic uh, changes. We have to use democratic in a, in a large scale word because obviously as, as uh, we all know uh, there was not free elections and there was not political freedom and uh, that closed down right away and then never came back. Uh, but there was democratic in a lot of other ways. So it, was a, it was a democratic republic, a Soviet democratic republic, not a parliamentary one, but a Soviet one. There was no, there was no czar, there was no God save the czar anthem. There was, there was uh, nationalities uh, were given rights, religions were given rights, women were given rights. Uh, a lot of purely the education changed, uh, we became a social right, a whole set of agenda. Of course, they, they were only starting on carrying them out, but it was there and they were working and it was happening. Now, when you get to socialist transformation in the economy, there, the picture changes and they're only taking little steps and, uh, and they're only, uh, uh, <laughs> and they're taking detours, or and they're, they're having retreats. And the reason for this is, uh, and Lenin says it. If you look at like uh, the Kautsky, uh, the Renegade Kautsky book in 1918, and then very good source, it's, it's instructive to read his remarks on the anniversary of the revolution each year. Uh, he, he, he looks back and he, he's honest and forthright about what he thinks is accomplished and not accomplished. And use, he's very proud of the democratic changes, vast sweeping democratic changes and apologetic and defensive about the lack of progress on socialist changes. Uh, and by the time he dies, you know, after the Civil War, they started on taking a few baby steps, but uh, uh, that uh, they uh, hadn't gone very far and he knew it. Okay, why was that? First of all, primarily because the logic of emergency wasn't the way both he and Trotsky in different ways thought it was going to be. The logic, what they thought the logic of emergency was, the emergency will make, will make us do the things that we socialists want to do. But it turns out the emergencies don't work like that. Emergencies make you do things you don't want to do and have to do. And that's what happened during the civil war and the, and the collapse of the economy. Uh, so, um, uh, so the logic sh shifted from the uh, what Lenin was saying in 1917. He said, 1917, we have to move towards socialism, take steps towards socialism because of the emergency. And afterwards he had to say, because of the emergency, we can't take steps towards socialism quite yet. We have to, we have to do this and that, the other thing. Okay, the, one reason why it's important to say this, it's obvious if you look at the <laughs> civil war and what was going on, but one reason it's important to say it is that there's something called, that people call war communism. And a lot of historians will tell you that uh, that the, the, actually the Bolsheviks went crazy about socialist transformation and they thought they were going, leaping into communism, leaping into the full socialism in 1920. The country's falling apart, people are starving, um, uh, but they somehow talked themselves into it. Well, that's all hooey. And uh, I've spent a lot of time uh, documenting the fact that's not true. Uh, no, uh, the, in fact, they did not moving towards socialist revolution, socialist transformation uh, and they knew it and they admitted and they talked about it. So, okay. Um, uh, so uh, what did they, what, what, what did they think they had accomplished? They thought they had accomplished setting up a worker peasant Vlast, sorry, worker, well, Vlast meaning 
authority, government, the sovereignty, uh, there, a, a power that was had the basis, had the only class basis that, that to, to move for socialism. Only a worker peasant uh, government lost system was able to move towards socialism. So uh, they, they had instituted it and they had defended it for four years of hard fighting. So uh, that they had done, so the road towards socialism was open, but they hadn't gone down very far down it. Uh, and then also, um, uh, so there was a change, however, uh, I think I'm going to end up with this. The change is that there was a change in that, uh, remember what we said about the peasants back when they were, when they were arguing back in 1907, six, whatever. Uh, they said the peasants uh, are a block toward, uh, a barrier towards socialism. Well, at a certain point, uh, I would say 1919 is the crucial turning point. They realized two things. They realized the first, the international revolution wasn't going to take place next month and not next year. And, you know, it just kept receding, but they stopped counting on it in the immediate future. And secondly, they realized that they could um, make a deal with the peasants, with the majority of the peasants, not just the, uh, not just the proletarian or the landless peasants. So they switched allies, as it were. Their main ally switched from the socialist ally uh, was no longer the worker, uh, the European workers who had were not doing their bit, uh, uh, and the peasants became more of an ally toward even socialism. So the real change here is then that the idea of proletarian leadership of the peasants—that's the core heart of Bolshevism. It stayed, but it got tweaked, and the tweak was a fairly substantial one. Before NEP, by the way, before 1921, it was that uh, um, that uh, we now maybe could lead the peasants all the way to socialism. Uh, the peasants are no longer a barrier. Uh, they they're they're different from the old type of peasants. We the proletariat are different from the we you know we're in power. We want to understand what we're doing, uh, and so so we will go forward. So. Uh, this is a little bit separate from socialism in one country, but essentially it is a change and it's changed. It's a change from what both Lenin and Trotsky and everybody else were saying back in 1906. So, uh, okay, I've talked on and on and on. Uh, and uh, I excuse this partly because I think it's a, a broad survey of the kind of issues uh, that are brought up and I've skimmed over a lot of things and done a lot of things and so, probably said one or two controversial things. So uh, I'm uh, now ready to, to open up. Uh, and uh, I'll just end with the conclusion of the slogan that, uh, again, what I said at the beginning, uh, there's a deep Marxist logic to talking about democratic revolution versus socialist revolution. And that goes to the deep Marxist logic of the workers are the ones who bring about their own emancipation. <clears throat> On the, but I'm wondering whether this framework is of any analytic or political use to us now. And uh, that's, uh, I haven't given us a huge amount of thought. So I'm, you know, let's, let's talk about it. Okay, thank you.